Excellent. That sounds like it started. So I will, in, without further ado, introduce Will, who is, for the last two years, been the research officer at the museum working on a project called A Wealth of Knowledge. And the floor is yours, Will. Cool. Thank you. Am I sharing the right screen, first of all? Where am I? Where is this the... Um... I can see a, a wealth of knowledge unlocking a decade of archaeological research. And you don't have my notes. <laughs> I don't have your notes, so the floor is yours. Cool, right. Um, well, uh, thanks everyone for sort of buying a ticket and coming along. Um, this talk is basically, um, is really closing the book on the Wealth of Knowledge project, which um, uh, the project started in early 2020, so getting on for three years ago now, and I just about two days ago, uh, submitted the final sort of the final copy of the research agenda to Lisa. So the, the pro with this talk, the project is is over, which is obviously quite sad. It's been it's been a, obviously extremely interesting to work on and really quite enjoyable to work on. Obviously, working with everyone at Wiltshire Museum has been a huge pleasure. Um, the project was obviously funded by Arts Council England. I'm fairly certain that might be an out of date name now. They might be Arts Council. And I'm pretty sure that logo is also out of date. That's the only one I had saved. So we're going with it. Um, the aims of the project uh, were sort of really in the name. It's to um, make the most of 10 years of archaeological research in sports museums collections because the museum um, prides itself, I think, on having quite a good relationship with uh, sort of um, academics and other researchers. And unfortunately, quite often the, the research that they do has no real sort of, there's no sort of system or process by which their results actually get regularly fed back into the collections management system. So most of the time what ends up happening uh, will be, it will just get added in as and when, or particularly when a museum, the museum has a particularly close relationship with the researcher, then there's that sort of ongoing dialogue. So the uh, people like Lisa and David are sort of kept aware of the, re the results, but especially for smaller scale projects and in particular for um, sort of students and people like that, there's no, there was no real way to make sure that information was constantly feeding back into our collections and our, then onto our displays and um, sort of public engagement with the collections themselves. So the project had um, four main aims. These were to enhance the collections with the knowledge and understanding from over 10 years of research, to make this new information publicly accessible, um, both through uh, updated gallery displays, as well as um, uh, publishing enhanced records on uh, sort of an up and coming uh, online database. We want, as I was sort of getting into there, we want to develop new processes to streamline the way the research was, um, uh, the results of research were fed into the collections. And we also want to identify gaps in the research into the collections that, so that we can then sort of prioritise and um, sort of try and guide researchers to answer the questions that we want, rather than uh, being sort of a passive observer in the process where Rather, where we're sort of just waiting for a researcher to come along, we can now say, these are the problems we want to see answered and solved. Does anyone want to fancy looking into them? So obviously none of this project would really be possible if the museum didn't already uh, keep uh, fairly detailed records of the researchers that access the collections. And as I said already, um, we'll have a really quite a good relationship with a number of academics from a number of uh, our educational institutions and obviously an institution such as Historic England. Um, for those of you who are potentially researchers and who are would be interested in using the collections, um, the research charter is on the museum website and that contains instructions on how to request access and what sort of information, uh, what sort of information uh, we would require from you to be able to uh, access them. So from uh, 20, between uh, 2010 and 2020, around 150 researchers requested access to the collections. And as you can see, the, the period breakdown is fairly predictable, to be honest. It was mostly people requesting to access the Neolithic and Early Bronze Ages, as you would sort of expect with the Avery and Stonehenge World Heritage Sites. 
um, the remainder is shared relatively equally between uh, the other the other historical periods. Um, one thing I think is quite interesting is the, the project really made it clear that not every one of these research visits actually led to any meaningful uh, results coming back into the museum. Either potentially the researcher didn't actually get the information they hoped to from the collections, or for whatever reason, uh, their research project um, just uh, didn't, they didn't complete their research project. And of course, there is the third category of people who just disappear after that first visit. Um, so we, from that 150, we identified about 80 uh, papers, sort of research projects, things that led to results that were both accessible, to, either accessible to the museum or fed back into the museum. Um, those 80 papers access 2,600 objects, and between those 2,600 objects, there were 2,900 individual requests between them, if that makes sense. So pretty much it was it was just over a one to one. Each object was accessed about once in the past 10 years. Each object that was accessed, I should say, although there is a little uh, notable group, particularly in the early Bronze Age, um, as you probably expect, the, some of the more sort of amazing, uh, some of the more sort of eye catching gold grave goods have been accessed repeatedly over this period. And that's why you get that sort of uh, distinction. Um, from this, we've been able to generate about 1,600, 1,700 enhanced records, and these will form the backbone of our um, upcoming online collections database. But in addition to this, just sort of generally uh, doing um, sort of the data cleaning and uh, um, sort of this, the associated sort of, uh, yeah, just working on the database, we've actually ended up updating about 20,000 records which equates to around half of the archaeological uh, records on the collections management database. So over the course of this project, we've made a, a sort of a massive difference to the, to the, the standard of data on the Wiltshire Museum collections management system, which will be sort of massively useful in, in, a, in, in the future for like relatively minor reasons, just in case of just um, sort of if you're looking for an object from a particular period or just searching for something, now the data should be much more consistent which will be, I think, a, a major benefit really coming up. Um, going into the enhanced records, I'm just looking first of all, this is an, the amber, an early Bronze Age uh, amber spacer plate necklace, uh, found one of the grave goods in the round barrel up to level G2E. So looking at the sort of just the improvements we made, you can see the level of detail that we were able to add compared to what was there before. So everything sort of outline, outlined in red is actually new and added in. So we've sort of made quite, these enhanced records are quite substantially improved. And just showing off another interesting bit of research that was undertaken. So this is by um, uh, Thomas Booth and Joanna Brook. Uh, Tom, uh, Tom Booth has actually given quite a few talks to the museum over the past couple of uh, months and years. So this one uh, was the, uh, based on radiocarbon dating of um, a trumpet made from a human femur found in another barrow, Wilsford G58. Um, I believe in the uh, in the gallery displays, this one's referred, this one is um, either the shaman or, well, I can't remember what this one, this guy's, oh, it's the, this is the master of ceremonies, I think, in the displays. So this one is really notable for some of the weird objects that found in, in with the grave, including this um, this uh, in the, uh, the sort of the bottom centre, the ceremonial goad. It's quite hard to picture it unless you're sort of familiar with um, early Bronze Age daggers. But that sort of slightly uh, like almost crenellated upper edge is actually broken, and that would have originally uh, been affixed to a sort of a shaft. So those prongs would have pointed up almost. And the idea is that it's some sort of ceremonial goad, but in reality, we, there's nothing actually like it. No one really knows what it's for or what it is. The graves, obviously the grave's also kind of weird in that it has a, a small axe or chisel, which is actually surprisingly rare for early Bronze Age graves in Britain. But um, yeah, what they were looking at was this a human bone femur. And by looking in, uh, by doing the radiocarbonating, they were able to uh, show that the person who had been buried had probably lived within the same sort of 
uh, time frame and probably had over, probably sort of coexisted with the person whose leg had been used. And again, we'd be able to add a huge amount of detail to this record. So once all this stuff does go online, there's, it's going to be a fantastic resource for just people generally interested or researchers too. So obviously producing a record of this um, sort of level of detail would be a huge drain on curatorial time and simply wouldn't really be possible. So we're, we've updated our research charter and we're introducing sort of new processes into the charter that will move towards a more, almost like a polluter pay scenario where we'll now request um, a much more detailed breakdown of the results from researchers. And then by um, taking advantage of some of modes, uh, modes being our collection management system, sorry, I sort of throw about these terms because I didn't forget that people don't sort of live in this world as much as I do. Um, by sort of making, taking advantage of some of the wider features that the museum wasn't before, and also actually having to uh, pay for some improvements to be made to our um, system. We've now made it so that quite a lot of this stuff can now actually be imported directly into our database from a fairly basic form. And this will um, generate a procedure record, which um, will massively cut down on the amount of sort of date, data entry that we required from Lisa, and also the amount of oversight. That, so with sort of minimal oversight, Lisa can then sort of uh, generate these new records and make these improvements sort of on a much more regular basis, essentially so that you don't, we don't need to do a wealth of knowledge project every 10 years. Hopefully after this, this can just be an ongoing process of um, uh, incorporating the results. So to look at, uh, to return to the period breakdown of projects, what, um, what you can really see is there's the immediate uh, sort of blank spot projects around the early medieval and medieval to post, the early medieval and medieval to post medieval periods. Um, and that's what I'll probably uh, focus on a bit at the end, we'll just talk about some of the collections we do have from those periods and some of the openings there are opportunities for uh, research there, but you can also see from this graph how uh, looking at the number of objects accessed wasn't actually as useful as I hoped it would be setting out. As you can see in the Paleolithic and Mesolithic, a huge number of uh, objects were accessed, and that's because some really poor individual individually accessioned a number of flints from a single Mesolithic site, which means there are about a thousand records that record an in individual flints, and I feel very, very sorry for whoever did that. <laughs> so going back into the this break, looking at the project specifically, you can see it's a much more sort of useful uh, metric for how the, how the um, uh, collections are being used by researchers. Uh, you can, as I sort of said at the start, we can see this sort of emphasis on the early Bronze Age, but actually what's sort of showing through here as well is we've got a number of projects looking at the late Bronze Age and the late Bronze Age through to Middle Iron Age. And actually that this is that's probably the period that sees the widest use, although only in sort of a relatively narrow aspect of those collections. What I think is also quite telling is that we've also got, although the Neolithic and um, the Neolithic and late Iron Age to Roman periods have sort of a quick, uh, similar levels of uh, research projects. When you actually look into the results from uh, those sort of pools of research, you can see that the Neolithic, the research into the Neolithic is far, far more impactful for our understanding of the collections than the research for the Roman period. And you can see um, uh, the, Roman, the research into the Roman period almost treats the collections database uh, almost treats the collections like an extension of the Port of Antiquity Scheme database, where people are sort of doing a, they're just, most uh, researchers in this period are looking at individual object classes, they're not really looking at um, assemblages or sites, or really giving us that sort of more holistic landscape scale uh, understanding. Obviously these bits of research are interesting in themselves, they, they improve our understanding of dating, they help with typological classes for um, categorizing and sort of organizing the collections. But in terms of that wider understanding, that's much less um, impactful for what we as a museum really need 
for producing interesting displays because frankly unless you're a specialist in that period knowing that a terror is a type c rather than a type d doesn't really matter that much but yeah you can sort of see the research basically falls off a cliff after the roman period and it's something that we really do want to uh, change so yeah so uh, actually this is uh, something that I already kind of went through uh, just then. So this is looking at a breakdown of the Roman Roman objects accessed by material and context. And you can see the majority are chance finds um, and the majority as well are copper alloy. And that's what I mean by the sort of almost using the collection as an extension of the portable antiquity scheme database. There's not that sort of in-depth look into our sort of wider archives that we hold from these sites. Um, here we're just sort of looking at a breakdown for the early medieval period and the way the collections are being used. So in this central sort of pie chart, in the, um, in the central pie chart, we have the materials. So you can see that the majority of the uh, material being accessed in the early medieval period is animal bone. And, um, sorry, you can hear the dog. Um, the, yeah, the majority being accessed is animal bone, but actually the it's only really being um, examined for quite a sort of a, super, not, not superficial, but uh, sort of quite a basic level. It's a sort of a standard sort of assessment of species and uh, that sort of thing. There's only actually been a single study of radio, uh, radiocarbon dating done very recently. Um, the human remains, by contrast, have been sort of accessed by a much sort of greater variety of uh, methodologies. We're seeing sort of the use of isotopic analysis, we're seeing, um, and this is uh, much closer to what we're seeing for the use of animal remains in the sort of early Iron Age, and this is what we mean by identifying these gaps in the research. Ideally, we'd like to be seeing these sort of methodologies also applied to the animal remains from this period, and that's now something we can highlight and show to um, uh, researchers and academics. So yes, this is just an example on the pages from the uh, uh, research agenda that we've produced. But um, moving on to um, some of the sort of the uh, um, sorry, I lost my place. Moving on to sort of the um, collections that the museum do does hold that are from these really underutilized periods. Um, the the collections from the early medieval and medieval periods like are not massive they're never going to sort of reach the same sort of amount of research that the early bronze age and sort of the later prehistory sees it's just not going to happen but the, these collections are actually really high quality and are extremely useful and definitely should be seeing wider use the early medieval period collections in particular and by um, early medieval period i'm talking about the year the period between um, the end of Roman Britain in 410 and the Norman conquest in 1066. The, the um, archaeological collections for this period are quite, um, quite unique in the museum collections in that they're almost exclusively made up of uh, assemblages excavated since 1975, which means we don't have many of the issues seen in quite a lot of earlier periods, uh, quite a lot of earlier and later periods really, where we have quite partial excavation records where they were either done in the 19th century or they're done in the early 20th, early, early 20th century, where we might have the fines but no paperwork, or we might have the fines and a bit of paperwork, but it's all quite jumbled up. These are sites that we have good documentation of. We have really quite, we know that these are representative samples of the uh, assemblages excavated because we can, we know what sort of selection strategies were employed, if, if at all really. And um, they're also well published as well. So it, ma it makes a massive difference and should mean these collections are sort of really ripe for wider research. Um, looking at the early medieval period, our, the uh, site sandwiches are really heavily biased towards the early and middle Saxon periods. So between about uh, 410 and about 850, 900 AD. And although 
Uh, we do have a little bit of later Saxon material. It's mostly from sites such as Luggershaw Castle um, in the east of the county, where it's a site that was predominantly later and it forms sort of like it's a possibly extends back sort of scenario. It's not, it's not a predominantly late Saxon assemblage. So um, the settlement evidence we have from this period is based largely around the sites at Grove Farm in Market Lavington and Cadley Road, Cadley Road in Colborne Juices. At both sites, a number of sunken, uh, sunken feature buildings were identified along with a potential post-built structure at East, so quite a standard early to middle um, Saxon settlement really. Although neither site has a huge amount of vertical stratigraphy, the, uh, uh, the sunken feature buildings nonetheless uh, were extremely artifact rich. And because of that, we have a really quite a sizable um, animal bone and ceramic assemblage from the settlements of both sites. And that's actually quite important for the region because both of these sites produce assemblages of about a thousand sherds for um, ceramics. Uh, when we compare that to the some of the other um, Anglo-Saxon sites that we hold in the collection, sites like Wellhead Lane in Westbury, um, it goes down to about 89. So it's these are really important assemblages regionally. Um, and another thing that was particularly interesting in these sites that doesn't appear to have been uh, looked into more deep uh, more deeply is that there is some there was some suggestion of a chronological dis distinction between different tempers used in the pottery. Obviously, it was really hard to to sort of look into that with so little vertical stratigraphy. But again, this is the sort of thing that we'd like to see sort of. Um, are looked into by researchers, can a project be built around this and can we support it? Um, obviously, uh, what makes these settlements sort of doubly interesting is that both are associated with at least partially contemporary uh, grave, uh, grave assemblages. So um, Cadley Road and Grove Farm are both, both quite sizable um, early Saxon uh, cemeteries. Um, in addition to these two sites, we will also soon be uh, taking in the deposition of Barrow Clump, recently excavated by Wessex Archaeology. And there's also the quite famous um, Saxon Cemetery at Blackmore Field in Pusey. And between these sites, we have a really uh, an extremely large and quite varied assemblage of grave goods, and in many cases with, with associated human remains. Um, and in addition to these ones, actually, we also have the really richly furnished Swallow Cliff Down bed burial excavated in the early 19th century. Um, so we have a really sort of varied and sort of an exceptional um, collection of early, uh, early medieval grave goods, but that were actually only accessed a single time in the last 10 years. And um, not, to, not to be disparaging to this particular researcher, but it was by somebody at a master's level and um, when you would, we would really expect to be, we would really hope to be seeing these in, engaged with uh, uh, by many more researchers. And then we'd also like to see them engaged with at a higher level too. We obviously want to encourage as many master's students as possible, but we also want to have the more sort of in-depth focused research that can come with a PhD. Um, one thing we particularly like to see is potentially some sort of material study or PX or F analysis or something like that. And obviously the, um, the sort of the relationship between this material and um, human remains also obviously brings out quite a lot of um, opportunities for research in that regard too. Um, in the past, these sort of assemblages have obviously been um, approached from a standpoint of sort of um, ethnicity and sort of identity, sort of between sort of Saxon and um, Angles and that sort of thing. And really this, these are concepts that Sort of more recent scholarship is really starting to move quite heavily away from and as time goes on these interpretations are just going to get more and more out of date and our displays therefore will get more and more out of date. Um, the other sort of site that we have um, from the early medieval period is actually completely different. This one's actually more of a, a middle Saxon site um, uh, this was a uh, Ramsbury excavated in the 1970s by Jeremy Haslam. And uh, 
this site's probably actually much less well known than the other ones, but it's no less interesting because here we have uh, a potentially a, a site with potential royal associations. Uh, Ramsbury was actually the site of a, a bishopric in the sort of later Saxon period. And what these excavations produced was a, a, a huge iron working site on an almost industrial scale. They found tons of metalworking debris. And they also found a sequence of middle, middle Saxon ironworking furnaces, as well as uh, uh, um, a huge number of tools from the period. So, and again, uh, this is an assemblage which has basically not been accessed in 10 years, at least, and I would suspect that number is actually much higher. Yeah, as, as sort of I've already sort of noted going through there, the, um, the main sort of avenues for future research seem to be in um, scientific analyses of the animal bone assemblages. And also any projects really utilizing the material culture from either the settlements or the ce uh, cemeteries, just because neither's really been engaged with very much at all. Um, I should say the sort of the, the master student who did work on the grave assemblages from Pusey actually came up with some quite uh, interesting results. They were doing a study on the um, uh, anthropomorphic and zoomorphic depictions on Anglo-Saxon jewellery and comparing the differences in uh, depictions between uh, Wessex and East Anglia. And from that, trying to infer differences in the potential um, sort of shamanistic or totem totemistic beliefs that the people may have held and again this shows the sort of the variety of sort of different avenues it can these materials can be approached from as to be honest i wouldn't have thought of doing that um looking at the actual the medieval period itself so the period after 1066 and going into the post medieval period too um the collections for this period are admittedly much smaller but what we do hold is an absolutely colossal amount of material from um, the excavations of Luggershaw Castle. Uh, the assemblage is actually so big it's shared between the museum and historic England. Um, the, the assemblage includes a huge amount of uh, ceramics, but a, also a, a massive animal bone assemblage that's never actually been uh, written up. It's not included in the final publication of the site. And yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's never actually been used for anything, but it's taking up about half of us, half of one of our stores. We also have a really interesting assemblage of small finds from the site and architectural remains. And uh, one of some of the most exceptional finds from the site, unfortunately I don't have a picture of it, um, is, one of, is one of the most complete 14th century glass vessels known and the assemblage from Luxor Castle really is exceptional. With, with, I should say as well, the bulk of the material dates to the sort of the 13th century and the 14th. And the assemblage at Luggershaw is really complemented by a pair of smaller assemblages from uh, Huish and Membry. So the assemblage at Membry was excavated by Grimes in 1941. It was originally thought to be another castle, but it's actually now thought to have been a, a moated manor house. So unfortunately, um, the site has never been published and an, an attempt was made in the 1990s, but uh, sadly the, the lady attempting it passed away before it was completed. So we have the fine assemblage and we also have at least partially uh, Grimes' original archives. And obviously uh, we're sort of just waiting for this uh, assemblage to be published really, because as it stands, very few people probably even know it exists. And um, the other uh, site, Hewish, has only really been, um, only really been very summarily sort of uh, published. We have all the finds from it. Unfortunately, the paper archive was um, reportedly deposited with the museum, but we couldn't actually locate it. But again, both of these sites are sort of 12th to 14th century, predominantly sort of probably extending a bit either way. And between them, they should represent a really sort of good sample of uh, medieval ceramics in that part of Wiltshire. And so that's potentially one avenue to go down. The other sites we have are uh, uh, Nash or Nash Hill near Laycock and uh, 
uh, another a pottery kiln in Langley Burrell in uh, near Chippenham. So um, uh, the pottery kiln in Langley Burrell was excavated in the late 70s, and an, I'll come back to it later actually, but it's another site that's never been published. Whilst a uh, nation nice has been published, is obviously a, quite an important medieval kiln and also a site where um, the production of sort of uh, encaustic tiles for churches was undertaken. So yeah, so uh, just going back to Luggershaw, one thing that really needs to be stressed is just the, the quantity of pottery from the site. It's boxes upon boxes upon boxes, and again, it's just not being used. So in addition to these settlement sites, we've also got these two kiln sites that I just mentioned. So uh, at um, Langley Burrell, um, what's actually quite interesting there is uh, uh, Wessex archaeology have recently undertaken uh, assessment in the same field and produced more evidence from these kilns. And so this really is quite a good opportunity for someone who wants to go in and do a more detailed assessment of the ceramics from the site to, to go in to have these fresh, these sort of fresh results with decent documentary evidence. Unfortunately, the paper records from the original Langley Borough excavations don't appear to have survived. They were deposited alongside the finds at the museum and they also um, weren't deposited with the Wiltshire HER. So, the, there is hope that they're potentially at Chippenham Museum somewhere, but I think sadly it looks like those records have disappeared. Um, the site, the ceramics from Langley were actually examined by Alan Vince as part of his PhD, who dates it to the 15th to 16th century, and he also makes mention of a archaeomagnetic date that actually goes back to the 14th century. So again, it's potentially a uh, a very good late medieval sort of ceramic um, ceramic exemption kiln site. Um, the Nash Hill kilns were are actually obviously published and much better known. Um, some of the most notable pieces uh, from the kiln are actually on display and including sort of a, a very elaborate uh, dragon spouted jug. The kilns produce sort of, in addition to the, the sort of the church tiles, the kilns also produce roof tiles. And what we'd like to see is again just sort of some projects making use of these quite large assemblages. In particular, one thing um, highlight is uh, as part of the extra place and time project, um, they have done quite a lot of work on Roman uh, Roman tiles in the extra region using a combination of PXRF and more traditional um, thin sectioning. And obviously, um, a PXRF comes with massive caveats for provenance in ceramics, but their point is that it can actually be used to distinguish between different sources, not necessarily provenance. And one thing that um, is noted in the original publication of the National Kilns is that attempts to chemically, attempts to chemically analyze the tiles have failed or had failed and it's also these kilns have also been accessed recently by um, Cotswold Archaeology for attempting to chemically link products from the kiln with ceramics they produced in a site named Bristol. So again, there's lots of avenues for these uh, these um, uh, assemblages to be used. Um, yeah, in the text of in the text of the research agenda, I toyed with the idea of describing the research into the medieval collections as negligible, but in the end, I I uh, avoided using that term because I thought it'd be unfair to the research that has been undertaken. But ultimately, the amount of research undertaken on the medieval collections is really quite small, and it is really smaller than it should be based on sort of what we actually hold, and it's now a question of why is that? Is it just that our collections are not well known? Is it when people think of Wiltshire Museum, they think of the early medieval collections as well as sites like Pottern? And is it a case of we need to um, we need to better promote these collections? Or is it a case of that researchers are aware of these collections and that uh, these assemblies can't support these research projects? In which case we need to have these start having these conversations with academics to try and identify how we can best sort of adapt our sort of co future collecting and as well as sort of um, with sort of long-term storage in mind. 
we need to start having these conversations about how we can best um yeah best utilize our sort of our space and our collections and the hope is that by producing this research agenda we can start having these uh, uh conversations so yeah um thank you very much everyone for listening i hope that was interesting Brilliant. Thank you, Will. Um, Al, if anyone has any questions, do put them in the Q&A. Uh, that was really interesting, Will. It's, um, it's a, great to see sort of the research side of the museum, because I think it's something that often people don't, don't see on the face of it, because it's such a big part of what we do. And I think it's really good that this project has brought that a lot more to the fore. But I've got a, a slightly... Um, not selfish question, but coming as an employee of the museum. So you mentioned some of the, the processes added to the research charter and how the museum sort of handles the research results, but what benefits will we see as the museum from that? Yeah, so as I sort of mentioned at the moment, there's no sort of, um, uh, there's no sort of, uh, sort of systematic way that the research results are incorporated. And so what, what essentially happens at the moment is we have our research charter and um, we essentially have to rely that a, a researcher in five years time will remember to send us their thesis or will have the same email address that we use them. Um, so what these new processes will hopefully do is that we will be asking for these results. Basically, we'll be, because we're asking for them in this much more de uh, much more detailed way, um, we'll be approaching them about this. We are sort of on our minds, and hopefully on the researchers' mind a lot sooner. Because at the end of the day, their actual primary res the, the primary results looking into our collections, depending on the the method being used, might actually be ready within a couple of months, or sometimes even on the day that they've accessed the collections. So we can get those actual initial results much more quickly, hopefully. And yeah, although um, obviously when people do provide their thesis, it's obviously extremely useful. Um, the, it's actually also uh, something that became particularly clear over the course of the project is quite how much curatorial time it takes to actually find the results in the thesis, because mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of words long, and it's not like there's a convenient table at the back that says, I accessed this object, this object, and this object, and here are my results pertaining specifically to these objects. So quite mm -hmm. often, even if there are tables, and even if they have used accession numbers, which actually is actually quite rare, very few researchers actually do seem to use the primary accession numbers when they're um, presenting their results. Mm. Always quite a lot of flipping back and forth, and the mm. hope is it's just making it more efficient. Um, right, so Hazel has asked, are all museums in the same situation? Are there any museums successfully promoting their collections that we we can learn from? Um, well, at the moment, it's really being it's a sort of it's really sort of um, I guess a, a sort of a vogue topic at the moment. So, Historic England have just done a big study on uh, the use of PhDs using museum collections across Brit across England and the Society for Museum Archaeology are actually starting another similar project now to sort of look into it. So I think Wiltshire Museum was actually quite unique in that we've kept these records in the first place. I think most museums wouldn't actually be able to answer. They would be able to sort of say probably like we they'd be able to like give general general uh, generalities or sort of observations based on what they've seen in their sort of, work, uh, sort of working life. But Wiltshire Museum actually, have, we actually have, before we uh, had obviously digital, we've actually also got notebooks going back to the, I think the late nineties, where every researcher has ever accessed the collections. We have records of, obviously that, I guess that's actually quite a big exclamation mark at this point. But, um, yeah, so it's, the Wilshire Museum seems to have been quite an unusual situation that we have these records, but I would imagine every museum will be known for a particular aspect of their collections. Um, I imagine it's going to be a case of waiting for these other big, big projects to come out and there is going to be this discussion about how to best utilise archaeological assemblages, sort of 
in museum collections. Mm -hmm. So you think this is going to be a big discussion going forwards so and yeah. more and more museums will be doing I it? Think, I think, um, yeah, we've kind of, uh, Wiltshire Museum has kind of put itself at the forefront and so, yeah, we're sort of a bit ahead of the curve, really, I think. Mm -hmm. And how researchers, researchers going to be encouraged to look at the collections from this? How is it really going to make the difference? Um, so I think the, the main thing we'll have is uh, we'll have our sort of our research agenda that will help us again sort of start these conversations with sort of researchers. And one of the things that sort of outlines the priority and the sort of agenda is to build up um, sort of these really sort of strong working relationships with specific academics. So at the moment, the museum works quite a lot with an uh, academic from Cardiff University called Dr. Richard, Ma Dr. Richard Madrick. And I think between basically the majority of the research into the later prehistoric collections are either done directly by him, someone who works for him, or one of his students he's directed onto the collections. Mm -hmm. So we need to start, I think, this sort of by highlighting this, what we'll start to do as a museum is um, build up these sort of relationships more proactively. And so we, we can identify these sort of high potential um, assemblages, we can then sort of try and garner ongoing or sort of long lasting interest in them. Excellent. I, th I think it's great, great for the museum that we're doing this. Uh, Jamie has asked, did you run out of steam when it came to talking about post-med or is there none to look at? <laughs> um, that's an awkward question. Because <laughs> yes, there's, there is, we hold very little post-medieval. We have a site called um, uh, New Park Street in Devizes where we have quite a good uh, post-medieval assemblage. Uh, assemblage but it's only about a thousand shirts and it's not, it's not actually that, it's not like the, the site is that notable. It's interesting because of where it is in Devizes. It's, I think it's actually um, basically on the border of the old castle, sort of earthworks, if I remember correctly. But it's, it's essentially it's a couple of rubbish pits that produced quite a lot of pottery, if I remember, remember right. Um, <laughs> Lamley Burrell obviously actually does extend into the post-medieval period too. It probably ends in the late, in the early 16th century. But yeah, the, the museum's uh, post-medieval collections in particular are, are really quite limited. It's probably mostly sort of a, a collection of individual objects and chance finds, and it's really hard to build it's really hard to build sort of research questions around those. So they were obviously not what I focused on in the research agenda. Not our specialty. <laughs> okay, and Su Susanna said, this is a great project. If only all museums did this. Thank you, Sia. Um, <laughs> are you going to set a condition for researchers in the future that they input information about individual objects to your database? <laughs> Um, so this is sort of one of the processes we were talking about where we've designed a couple of forms where basically we will be, as part of the research agenda, uh, research charter, sorry, we're going to reword that slightly. So now basically as part of as part of accessing the collections, they are basically agreeing to fill in this form and the form has been made in such a way that we can then convert it into a different file type that can then be imported directly into modes and through various modes is quite cumbersome. Bit of software so it's far more stages than actually I think I would prefer it to be really but in theory um, hopefully from now on the researchers will just fill in the spreadsheet and then we can work from it from there I think in reality there is still going to be some cleaning up to do but it will still be absolutely minute compared to uh, what I had to do for this project where basically for a 30-month project I think the first 12 months were the data entry side of it of going through the projects and improving the most database where obviously hopefully from now on it won't take anywhere near that much time <laughs> excellent you're saving a lot of pain for the <laughs> future that's it and joe has said will the economic situation impact detrimentally on the future of this important project the value of sharing your findings widely is very clear um, well, unfortunately, the project's over, so mm. it'd be great to have a job, but well, I've got a job, but it'd be great to have, <laughs> it would be great for my old job to carry on existing. But yeah, it was always, I think it's the nature of these sort of projects, they're always project funded. So it was always 
um, Arts Council provided money for a particular period of time to undertake a specific sort of research question. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the sort of processes we put in place means that there won't need to be a dedicated member of staff to do this in the future. But yeah, I think all museums are obviously going to start feeling the pinch with the cuts coming up. So yeah, but yeah, the, like, like you say, it's the work you've done is is so hugely important for going forward. So I think that's going to make a huge, huge difference and make it so much easier for our curator Lisa to keep going with the work as well, isn't it? It's it's, it's mm -hmm. been a huge impact. So I mean, speaking on behalf of all the staff, we're so grateful for everything you've done for the project, Will and. I think it's fair to say that the project's been a huge success. I know that our creator Lisa is doing the evaluation at the moment, but I think it's all, I mean, it's, you've done, did what you set out to do, really. <laughs> and um, I think, oh, sorry. I, I should also say, actually, the research agenda, I don't know if it's on, the, I don't think it'll be on the website quite yet. There are some draft chapters that were up, put up for the Wiltshire conference, but um, hopefully David will be putting up the final document in the next couple of days, so that will be available to read soon. Yeah, and there, there is some more information about the Wealth of Knowledge already on the website, and that is under Collections and Research, so you can find out more there and watch this space. Excellent. Any last questions for Will? So, and that, that was re really helpful for me as well, Will, because um, like I said, for, for the rest of us at the museum, it's um, we've seen Will staring at lots of spreadsheets for the last two years. So it's, it's, it's really nice to see how it's all come together and the impact that this will have going forward. And um, it'd be interesting to see how this transfers to, to other museums. And I know there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to see how this will progress as well with um joining our databases up and all that stuff so excellent right if there's no further questions then i'll say thank you very much will for your time today and for the last two years of staring at spreadsheets and um what was it a thousand flints did you say that was one person had had to go through so at least it wasn't yeah. quite that painful for you well that, that one i found that out about that because um I realised some, somebody had accessed those flints and I looked down the sort of the barrel of having to update a thousand records of flint and I said, I'm not doing it, I'm just going to make a new record that includes all the flints. <laughs> See, helping our processes all yeah. the time. That's brilliant. Well, um, I'll say a huge thank you um, for everyone joining in. I hope you find that interesting. If you have any more questions for Will, uh, do email us on hello at wiltshiremuseum.org.uk and we can pass them on to Will and get any answers for you. But do check out our website and look at the research agenda, find out a bit more and watch this space. And if any of you are researchers, do get in touch um, with Lisa, our curator, and um, do start using collections because obviously we've got a lot more to be used that is being underutilized. So excellent. Uh, have a lovely evening, everyone. And I hope it's warmed up in all your houses and I hope the heating is doing its job. And I shall say thank you very much. <laughs>